Hi, everybody. Uh, I'm Dr. Bruce Bloom. I'm the Chief Science Officer at the Kabuki Syndrome Foundation. I'm glad to welcome you to this, our second webinar. We did one, uh, the last webinar, where we introduced our research roadmap called LEAP. Uh, today, we're going to talk about the first project of LEAP, which is uh, about LEARN, the L in LEAP. If you didn't attend, attend the last webinar, don't worry about it. Today's webinar will make total sense to you. You can always go back and look at the last uh, webinar at your leisure. You can watch it whenever you want. So um, moving on to the next slide, LEAP is our two-year, $3.5 million plan to find treatments to push those forward for Kabuki syndrome. And at our webinar last month, we unveiled this research roadmap, which is based on what you, the community, told us were your greatest needs, what you needed around Kabuki syndrome. Plus, we got input from our medical and science advisory board, our KSF board, and other advisors, and then over 20 years of rare disease drug development experience, our director of research, Dr. Clara Tang, and I bring to the KSF community. So each step of the roadmap is designed to bring treatments to the community. Today, we're going to look at the L in LEAP, which is LEARN. And we look forward to diving into Enable, Accelerate, and Prepare as the year goes on and sharing our progress with you in each of those areas. Uh, multiple projects are underway, and you can read more about them in our, in our mid-year report. The amount of work in Kabuki syndrome is very exciting, and there's lots more we can do as a community with your help to ensure that we bring successful treatments um, to everybody. So um, as we get into to learn, um, there's still gaps in knowledge, and these gaps represent the potential for us to bridge these to get to treatments if we can address those gaps. And we're gonna show you how we can unlock more of the science and treatments through what Clara's gonna talk about today, which is the KSF Discovery Grant. She's gonna share more on our progress on the grant at the end of this presentation. And I wanna emphasize that LEAP, and particularly this grant portion of LEAP, is something that not only you, but the key researchers around the globe thought we needed. So if you go on to the next slide, you'll see that we had all these great scientific advisors and, and clinicians. Many of you know some or maybe many of these people. And we asked them, what are the greatest needs, the highest priorities in developing treatments at in Kabuki? And the first one was outcome measures and biomarkers, and we're working on that. And the second one, almost tied with the winner, was a better understanding of the molecular pathways causing Kabuki syndrome. In other words, the science that we need to understand so that we can then figure out how to create the treatments. Because without this fundamental knowledge of Kabuki syndrome, we wouldn't understand what causes the symptoms and the researchers would be limited in finding the treatments. So we have a plan and we're gonna describe the science of Kabuki for you as we know it now. So you can have a better idea of how we think the treatments are gonna be developed and what's possible if we all work together, including you, the community, plus the scientists and the clinician and KSF. So um, we've broken today's presentation into chapters. So it's easy for us to see how the science affects you, members of the community. And you should have time, we should have time for questions at the end, um, uh, if you have any. You can also type them in the Q&A and we'll try and answer them during the presentation. And if you think of something after the webinar is over, just email us and we'll get you an answer. So why do we think this is so important? And the reason is because explaining the basic science to the community can show all of you why and how treatments are possible. And it can also illuminate more of the science as a way of paving the, the path to treatments. And we. We can do this by funding our discovery grants. Today, we're going to understand how funding the science can result in treatments. And so I want to thank the many of you who have sent in your photos and stories, like this photo right here of one of the members of our community, so we can better understand your perspective and share your uniqueness and diversity 
of this special community. So in a moment, Dr. Clara Tang, our Director of Research, will get started. I've known Clara for many years now. She's curious and has a keen intellect, and she's going to use her PhD in neuroscience and her background in rare disease collaboration management to drive meaningful research for Kabuki syndrome. And also today, she's going to use it to explain the L in learn to you. So I'm going to turn the presentation over to Clara. Thank you, Bruce. Um, so what do we know about Kabuki syndrome so far? So we know that Kabuki syndrome is caused by mutations in one of two genes, KMT2D or KDM6A. But what does that actually mean? Well, at a high level, our bodies are made up of trillions of cells, and in each cell, it contains an instruction manual that tells our bodies how to grow, work, and function. And this instruction manual is called our DNA. Sections of DNA, like individual sentences of the, individual, uh, of the instruction manual, are called genes, and genes provide instructions on how to make proteins. Proteins are molecules that play many critical roles in the body. They work together to do different jobs in the cells and are required for the structure, function, and regulation of the body's tissues and organs. In Kabuki syndrome, the genes that we're most interested in are the KMT2D and KDM6A genes. They produce the KMT2D and KDM6A protein respectively. Now in Kabuki syndrome, the KMT2D or KDM6A genes have mistakes or typos called mutations. This means that there are some typos or mistakes in the instructions on how to make the KMT2D or KDM6A protein. This results in a KMT2D or KDM6A protein that doesn't function as they should. And when the KMT2D or KDM6A protein isn't functioning as it should, this causes a cascade of other downstream pathways in our body to break down or to not happen at all, which results in the symptoms that you see in Kabuki syndrome. Now, what does the KMT2D protein and KDM6A protein actually do? And how do they impact so many different tissues and organs in the body? Well, to explain this, we need to take a closer look at the DNA. So the DNA instruction manual is very, very long. So if you stretch the DNA in just one cell all the way out, it will be two meters or six feet long. So for the DNA to actually fit inside a cell, which is tiny, the DNA tightly coils around proteins called histones. And the histones then stack on top of each other, all bundled together, forming a fiber called chromatin. When these bundles are tightly wound up, it's like the pages of the books are closed and cannot be read. And we call this closed chromatin. When the bundles are loose, it's like pages of the books are open and can now be read. And we call this open chromatin. Our chromatin is always switching back and forth between open and closed, depending on which genes need to be read in that particular cell at that particular time. The KMT2D and KDM6A proteins are involved in opening chromatin, and they're very important proteins that tell the cell whether some of our other genes or instructions should be read. And when they're not working as they should, like in Kabuki syndrome, the book stays closed and other proteins cannot be made. So to treat the symptoms of Kabuki syndrome, we can look at restoring the function of the KMT2D or KDM6A protein, or by restoring a pathway that the KMT2D or KDM6A protein acts on, which researchers have shown can improve symptoms in a mouse model of Kabuki syndrome. So I will dive a bit deeper into the science over the next five or so minutes. Um, I will explain in a bit more detail what the KMT2D and KDM6A proteins do, what happens if they don't work as they should, and some of the strategies that researchers are exploring to treat the symptoms of a Kabuki syndrome. If this is a bit much, um, feel free to go get a cup of tea or coffee and then come back. Um, if there is something, anything that is puzzling or something that you don't understand, um, please just drop your questions in the Q&A. We have some time for Q&A at the end of this webinar, and if we don't get to manage, if we don't get to your question live, we will follow up after the webinar. So just to briefly recap, every cell in our body has DNA, and sections of DNA are genes, which encodes instructions on how to make proteins. The KMT2D gene makes the KMT2D protein, and the KDM6A gene makes the KDM6A protein. When there is a mutation or typos in the gene, this changes the instruction, which then results in a faulty protein that doesn't function as it should. Now, normally, 
the KMT2D and KDM6A proteins are part of a group of highlighters and erasers that plays an important role in a process that adds or erases markers to open or close chromatin. And there are several different highlighters and erasers that add or erase open or closed markers on the chromatin that keep the chromatin balanced between open and closed. And this balance is so important for the normal development and functioning of the body. Now, the KMT2D protein is a highlighter. So it adds open markers to histones to open chromatin so that DNA can be read. Now, in Kabuki syndrome type 1, there is a mutation in the KMT2D gene. So producing a KMT2D protein highlighter that doesn't function as it should. So it can't add open markers to open chromatin. And this results in too much close chromatin such that the DNA can't be read. The KDM6A protein, on the other hand, is an eraser. So it erases closed markers on the chromatin to keep chromatin open. In Kabuki syndrome type 2, there is a mutation in the KMD, KDM6A gene that produces a KDM6A protein that doesn't function as it should. So the eraser is broken. So it can't erase closed chromatin marks to open chromatin. Now, this again results in too much closed chromatin. And so the DNA instructions can't be read. So these unread DNA instructions may contain information for making a wide range of other proteins, which now won't be made. And without these proteins, other functions or downstream pathways in our body break down or don't function as they should, which then leads to the symptoms that you see in Kabuki syndrome. And there are several different ways that we can treat Kabuki syndrome. And I will outline some of these strategies and these strategies some of them are being actively explored, while some of these are really for the future. So the first strategy, and the one that is most advanced, is really restoring the balance of open and closed chromatin. So as we mentioned earlier, a set of erasers and highlighters maintain balance between open and closed chromatin. And there are erasers that erase open chromatin marks, closing chromatin. So in this example, on Kabuki syndrome type 1, the KMT2D highlighter doesn't function as it should. So open chromatin markers are not being added, but the eraser that erases open chromatin marks continue to function, which then leads to too much closed chromatin. We can look at using a drug to inhibit the function of this eraser. So open chromatin marks are not being erased. This then counterbalances the effect of the faulty KMT2D protein and restores the balance between open and closed chromatin states. So this is a strategy that is targeted by the modified Atkins diet and the Horizons drug. Another strategy is to increase the expression of the normal copy of the KMT2D gene. Everyone has two copies of nearly every gene, one from your mother, one from your father. And a treatment strategy could be to increase the function of the copy of the KMT2D gene that doesn't have the typo. So more proteins that function properly are made and therefore restore the function of KMT2D. We're still in very early stages of exploring this strategy, but we do have researchers looking into this. A third potential strategy is to modify or edit the KMT2D or KDM6A gene to fix the typos. And this is called gene editing. We can deliver molecules and machinery into the cells that can fix the mutations of typos to fix the instructions such that a normal protein is produced. And the normal protein can then go on and perform its function, minimizing the symptoms of Kabuki syndrome. Now, this is a potential strategy for the future. The technology for this is still in very early stages. And there are so many mutation variants in Kabuki syndrome. So typos at different places of the KMT2D or KDM6A gene that cause Kabuki syndrome. So it's likely that this will be a more personalized approach and a range of different options will be needed. The last strategy that I will describe here is restoring the function of one or more of the downstream pathways that have broken down or are not functioning as they should. Scientists have identified some of these pathways or cellular processes that are affected in Kabuki syndrome and are exploring some drugs that can modify these pathways to alleviate the symptoms of Kabuki syndrome. However, we still have many questions. KMT2D and KDM6A are very important proteins and we know that there are so many different symptoms, so many different organs that are affected in Kabuki syndrome. 
You can imagine that there are many pathways and processes that are affected. Researchers have identified some of these pathways, which I'll go through in the next slide in our pipeline, but we've barely scratched the surface. There are many, still many different pathways that we have not yet identified and how these changes lead to the symptoms of, of Kabuki syndrome. If we don't know what they are, we can't design drugs against these targets. So there is a lot more that we need to learn and find out, which is what we are aiming to rectify with the Discovery Grant. We've received nine projects to learn more about these different pathways and different ways that we may be able to alleviate the symptoms of Kabuki syndrome. So this is our current therapeutic pipeline. So starting from the top, we have the modified Atkins diet, which is already in clinical trials. There's also Fabi Dumstadt from Avrizin, which is nearing the start of clinical trials. And both of these therapies aim to restore the balance between open and closed chromatin, which is the therapeutic strategy that the first strategy that I described. The next three look to restore some of the downstream pathways that are affected in Kabuki syndrome. So the therapy from Notre Dame stimulates the production and maturation of new brain cells. The Boston Children's Hospital is exploring some repurposed candidates. So this means that they are looking at whether drugs that have already been approved for other diseases can work or be effective for Kabuki syndrome. And then lastly, we have also ATR inhibitors. Researchers at University of Trento have identified that ATR is one of the pathways that are affected in Kabuki syndrome. And they're testing some ATR inhibitors, which have already been approved for other diseases to explore whether they can be repurposed for Kabuki syndrome. There are also four other candidates that are in earlier stages of development that look to restore the function of some of the uh, uh, downstream pathways as well as increase the expression of the copy of the KMT2D gene that don't have the mutation variant. It's great that we have these candidates, but we don't want to have all our eggs in one basket. We need to strengthen and diversify our therapeutic pipeline to make sure we have therapeutic opportunities for all people with Kabuki syndrome. Science and genealogy are always advancing and drug development is hard. So in clinical trials, can fail, so we need to have options and alternatives, and this is the goal of our discovery grant. To be able to discover and develop new therapeutics, we need a good understanding of Kabuki syndrome. We are awarding an annual discovery grant to accelerate research into Kabuki syndrome, to accelerate the identification of new therapeutic opportunities. And to apply, researchers form a team of at least two people based at two or more different institutions. And this is to enforce collaboration because collaboration is so important in speeding up rare disease research. It will enhance the collective expertise and potentially lead to more comprehensive outcomes. The budget of the grant is around $150,000. All funds will be used solely for direct recost related to the research project. Overhead and other indirect costs will not be supported. And now where are we with the discovery grant? Applications to the grant for this year have closed. They closed at the end of June this year, and we're in the review process. And we plan to announce the winners of the grant in Q4 in November this year. I'm very grateful and excited to share that we received nine applications on very diverse projects that focus on various aspects of neurological, developmental, and immunological symptoms of Kabuki syndrome. There are also applications looking at both type 1 and 2 Kabuki syndrome. We had 24 applicants in total from 17 institutions located in three countries. We've also recruited 12 re reviewers from academia, industry, as well as caregivers from the Kabuki syndrome community to give us a wide range of perspectives on these applications. And we're very excited to have our reviewers read and share feedback on these applications. And we have set aside a budget to fund one of these projects. But we wish we can fund more of these excellent projects. So we need your help. Great. Thank you, Clara. Uh, I just want to remind everybody, I know that was a lot, um, but it's so important. And questions are always welcome. And you're going to be able to revisit this recording on our YouTube time and time again, anytime it helps. So thank you again. And we are so grateful to have this research team of Clara and Bruce. We also had Jessica Weatherstone, who is also a parent 
and was instrumental in creating this deck to help us understand. And thank you guys for bridging the gap between the science and our families so we all know how we can make our kids' lives better. Um, and I am going to say our kids today because I'm a parent too. My name is Amanda Gamboa and my daughter has Timothy syndrome. I'm here today and working and volunteering with the foundation every day because I truly believe that research is the key. It is the key to creating the brightest, healthiest future possible for my daughter and for your kids too. I've seen firsthand the power of research and the barriers and the biggest barrier is funding. As Clara illustrated, there are multiple real possible pathways to treatments, but funding the research is absolutely necessary to get those treatments. And we're a rare disease, so that means no one is coming to help us. Treatments are going to be made possible by us. So we have identified multiple opportunities that will accelerate this path to treatments for everybody with Kabuki syndrome, and that's our LEAP roadmap. We're actively trying to secure funding for priority projects within LEAP, and those are the projects that are going to have the greatest impact, excuse me. So as a community here today, we do have the collective power to fund the discovery grant and we can make a difference. So as Clara said, we have secured funding for this year's discovery grant, but there are nine excellent applications. And with your help, we know that we can fund more. We can fund more discoveries that lead to more treatments. So for example, if everybody on our mailing list could give $100 over the next year, we could fund another discovery grant. And I know, because I'm a parent too, with the medical bills, the therapies, the co-pays, the equipment, it all adds up. And $100 is a lot of money. But broken down, that is less than $10 a month. So I, I could never put a dollar on my kid's health in future. But if I could, how much can I invest? Invest in her future each month, knowing that research is the way to literally change her life. Can I commit $20 a month? That's why I'm here. And that's why I devote my time to driving research with KSF, because this is how we unlock those brightest futures. And everyone can play a role. You can donate, fundraise, volunteer, and this includes people with Kabuki syndrome too. So in the coming months, we will be hosting two separate events and we'll also have new fundraising tools so you can activate your network. So I, families who are here today, I wanna to make sure that you save the date for November 7th. And like last year's conference, we'll have an update from the researchers. We'll have panels featuring families and adults with Kabuki syndrome and tools that you can use now. And for our researchers, another project within LEAP, we're hosting the scientific symposium on October 26th. Um, and our call for abstracts is open until August 10th. So now we are gonna open to questions because we wanna make sure that you guys all understand how this research truly can impact you. Um, we're gonna be here until the end of the hour. And just a quick reminder that we are happy to help answer questions, but we cannot give medical advice. Bruce and Clara are wonderful doctors in their fields. They are not medical providers. So we cannot provide medical advice. Um, but we're happy to answer any questions. If you're more comfortable emailing us, you can of course do that as well. Clara, do you wanna kick off with the first question? Yes. So there, um, so Kate Palmer asked, are there grants being made internationally in order to obtain knowledge from around the world? So we do have researchers from I guess around the world, both from Europe and the US apply. And yes, we are very much open to knowledge and really funding research where the experts are doing research. Um, so yes, we are, the grant is open to research as well. Yeah, and I wanna, I wanna add to that. Um, one of the things that's great about the Kabuki syndrome uh, community on the science and clinical side is how well everybody works together. So um, we, we have lots of relationships between US-based researchers and researchers around the world. Uh, and within Europe, people are, are working across countries. So it's really an exciting time for Kabuki syndrome. And uh, we were we were really gratified to get a number of projects in the um, Discovery Grant program from from Europe. Uh, I know Clara's also reached out to some researchers in Australia where they're doing some work down there. So we're we're working around around the world, and also um, there are some Canadian researchers that are very involved in our 
our KSOC, the, the Kabuki Syndrome Outcome Measures and Biomarkers Consortium as well. And then we have our science question. Please, can you simplify, explain how you increase expression of the working gene? On the very simple level, so when your gene is being expressed, so when your gene is being read and then turned into a protein or made into a protein, there are activators that actually tell the gene that this particular gene needs to be read. And so you can look at increasing the activity of these activators that then promote the expression of the gene, to put it very simply. So there are you know, multiple processes. If you, if you notice in the slide, there are multiple different arrows from the gene to the protein. And to get between the gene and the protein, there is yeah, a whole set of other proteins and enzymes that uh, tell the genes to actually make it into protein. Um, you can enhance the, the activators that promote the expression of the gene, which is one of the ways that you can increase the expression of the working gene. Right. And if you if you listen to some more scientific stuff, you might hear the term upregulate. So the the way genes are turned on and off is called regulation. And so if you have a gene, it, you know, if you think of someplace outside of of the scientific community, let's say you have a machine that that makes loaves of bread, and you have it turned on so that it's it's supposed to make one loaf every ten minutes but you can speed it up to make two loaves every 10 minutes or three loaves every 10 minutes by just changing the dial, upregulating the speed with which it'll do that. And we can do that with genes. We just have to find, as Clara said, what are the activators, what are the switches that we have to flick so that the gene works more frequently. And there are lots of ways to do that. You can do that with, with drugs. You can do that with um, biological kinds of uh, things. There are even people who are turning genes on and off in other diseases with light therapy and other kinds of things. So there's many ways that scientists are looking at upregulating or reactivating a working copy of a gene. And um, there's, there's lots of science going on right now some of which is really going to be applicable to Kabuki syndrome. And there are many researchers that are working right now on upregulating the healthy gene in KMT2D. Amanda, there is a question about uh, really keen to help, but we need to find a way from the UK to do so to a charity. Absolutely. I'm glad that there are so many people from around the globe here today. I just want to say thank you for joining because this is for everybody around the globe, as is the research. Um, we are working on securing a, a vehicle so that donations that come from abroad can also have that tax benefit. And we look forward to rolling that out later this year. So when I say save the date for that November 7 conference, it's going to be really pivotal. It's going to be a big fundraising day. It's an opportunity for international families to activate their networks that way. And then I also see a question about how patients can participate in research and specifically internationally. So we're gonna roll out more later this year with more um, explicit things that you can do. But right now on our website, you can go to research opportunities and things are broken down by virtual and in-person. And in that virtual section, if something is open to international participants, we would love to have you start participating today. The one that I'm thinking of is something that you can do from home in any country in about 30 minutes. And that would be great. And um, there's a quick one from Lucy. Um, is there a way to listen to the talks at the scientific conference? Will they be recorded or will the abstracts be published? We are planning to record the scientific conference mm -hmm. and that will be shared after. So the scientific conference is on the October 26th. Um, and yeah, we will share the recordings from that. Symposium afterwards. Amanda, do you have anything else to add? 
No, when, whenever possible, we, you know, it is our mission to connect you guys to the research and to the science. So whenever possible, we are going to summarize it. We're going to distribute it. If it's a recording, we're going to put it on YouTube whenever possible. So a good way to stay up to date, which if you're here, you're probably signed up for our newsletter. But if you need to catch up, we have a news tab on our website that you can check out. And as they see a series of blog posts of what's been happening behind the scenes. Right. We have another science question for Richard Jones and also from Liz in the chat. Um, if there is an error in the gene, does the copy of the gene never work or just work inefficiently? Is that what explains the range of severity of symptoms? And Liz also asks a very similar question. If one of the genes is working and one is not, does that cause confusion or cause them both not to work? So Kabuka syndrome is a, what they call a haploinsufficiency, which is that um, the KMT2D gene, it requires two copies of, two normal copies of a gene for the normal uh, phenotype, the normal uh, working of the body. So when it's a, um, when one copy is not working or um, it's deleted, then the dosage of the normal protein generated by just one wild type gene is not sufficient for complete function. Um, so there are also many different types of mutation variants in Kabuki syndrome. So um, the majority have a, a deletion in the gene, which means that uh, I guess a, a smaller protein usually is made or um, yeah, a protein is not really made at all. Um, so it, so it, yeah, it doesn't function when you require actually two copies of the gene to work. Um, there are also other mutation variants, uh, which we can um, go into more detail in a subsequent webinar, but um, most of you will have yeah, sort of a, a loss of function mutation. That means that um, the gene because makes a protein that doesn't quite work at all. Um, and does it actually cause confusion uh, and make them both not to work? Our understanding is, I think the wild type protein still gets made um, as just the dosage of the protein is not sufficient. So the single wild type gene is not really sufficient for the complete function, um, and which hence then we get the symptoms of Kabuki syndrome. And perhaps the dosage varies a lot between different people, and therefore you get the range of severity of symptoms. Yeah, I, I would also say sometimes the explanation of the range of severity of the symptoms is also caused by potentially other mutations and other processes that somebody would have. So one of the things that we know about a disease like Kabuki syndrome is that even if two patients have the exact same mutation in the KMT2D or K, uh, KDM6A gene, they might not have the same expression of disease in their symptoms. And that's because they probably have other differences in their genetic profile going on. They might have differences in their, in their gut microbiome, the bacteria that help break down food. They might be taking certain kinds of medications for other things. There's lots of things that, that um, create differences between one person with the same genetic disorder uh, in, in Kabuki syndrome. And also, as Clara said, you can have a different mutation in the KDM6A or KMT2D gene that will make it not be functional, but it won't be exactly like the mutation that somebody else has. And so it will work slightly differently. There are some diseases that have genetic um, mutations like this that make a protein, and then you can, the protein either functions okay, it functions uh, really poorly, or it doesn't function at all. And sometimes you can restore that. The kinds of issues we have in Kabuki are not like that because the what they're doing is opening and closing the chromatin. And so it's a little harder to 
work on them uh, like that. We also have a, um, a question from Lucy about uh, there's dietary interventions in a drug being tested for type one, but are there ideas about what can be used for type two to restore chromatin balance? So there are some things that we're looking at in, in type two. Um, it would be great if we could look at gene therapy in Kabuki syndrome for either type one or, or type two, but the genes are very big. And right now, the way that most gene therapies are, are done is you have to put the new gene inside a virus, and the virus then goes to the site and delivers the new gene, and it gets incorporated. But the Kabuki genes are too big to fit in the viruses that we use right now. Um, Clara and I recently heard from one of our board members about somebody who's looking at a different way of doing um, gene therapy that might be possible where you can just fix a portion of the gene instead of replacing the whole gene. And so we'll be talking to them uh, upcoming. And that would be one way that we could potentially work on uh, KDM6A. Um, since in KDM6A, there isn't the same kind of wild type or healthy uh, gene that can balance that out. Clara, do you have anything you want to add for, for that question from Lucy? I mean, we do have, you know, the um, researchers are looking also at type 2 Kabuki syndrome. Um, and, you know, we have received discovery grants that specifically focus on type 2 Kabuki syndrome as well. So this is definitely something, an, an important uh, area of research for us, as well as, I mean, type 1 Kabuki syndrome. So this is, yeah, both very important and definitely something that we are very mindful and remember very clearly. Yeah. So. And, and you got people on the inside making sure they don't forget. I'll just say it that way. <laughs> uh, KDM6A is well represented within the foundation um, and our, our researchers are, are very aware that, that we're here for everybody and designing research for everybody as well. So I just wanted to add that. Sorry, Kabar. Great. Um, we've got a question from Anonymous. Um, can these possible treatments reverse damage that has already occurred or just prevent new damage? No, I think most treatments are really, um, I guess, you know, most treatments will probably look at preventing new damage, but we do have, you know, one of the therapies, the one that I mentioned from Notre Dame, do look at um, stimulating new brain cells and maturation of new brain cells. So potentially, you can potentially reverse damage, but it is normally a much harder, I guess, benchmark for drug development. Um, so, you know, preventing new damage is probably the primary goal, but, um, you know, when we're successful, reversing damage is also absolutely something that we want to also look at. Uh, and I, I would also, this brings up the whole idea of making sure we get early diagnosis for patients and when treatments are available to make sure they're tested, uh, can get tested on younger populations. So the earlier you can impact uh, the life of somebody who's working with or who's living with Kabuki syndrome, the less uh, they'll be affected for life. So if you can get in there and slow down or stop the, um, the disease process at an early stage, you can prevent some of these things from building up. Um, I also think it's it'd be possible later on to think about if we can stop the progression of some of the symptoms of Kabuki syndrome, how we might help restore or regain some function. In another, um, in another disease that I was working in, we had patients with um, uh, physical limitations where they lost the use of a, a limb or something like that. And we were able to restore some brain function uh, to get that limb moving again when we didn't think early on, it didn't seem like that would be possible. But it, 
there's a lot of um, plasticity in the brain and areas in the brain that normally don't control something can be taught to control it and you can sometimes get some function back. We're not yet looking at that in Kabuki syndrome, but I think that um, as that kind of therapy matures in other diseases, I think we'll find that we might be able to import some therapies from other diseases that could help restore some function in Kabuki syndrome. So Anana has also asked, can a Kabuki syndrome patient live a normal life, like get married and build a family? And how high is the chance that the children will have Kabuki syndrome? I have personally definitely met Kabuki syndrome uh, individuals with Kabuki syndrome who have gotten married. And so that is definitely a possibility. Um, how high is the chance that the children will have Kabuki syndrome? Um, you know, KMT mutations can be passed on to the next generation. So it can be inherited. So there is, um, you know, if one of the parents have uh, Kabuki syndrome, there's probably a good chance that um, the children will also have Kabuki syndrome. Uh, Amanda, do you have anything else to add? About uh, yeah, and I can loop in a little bit of another question too. Uh, some people are talking about the difference between type one and type two. Um, and I just wanted to say like, it's not just it's not just type one and type two. There are absolutely differences there. We also see differences in gender, like within type two, type two boys are a lot different than type two girls. And then within that, like the type two girls, they still have type two Kabuki syndrome, but each mutation can cause a different presentation. So that's why when we say people with Kabuki syndrome are unique, they're unique in that they have Kabuki syndrome and they're unique compared to other Kabuki syndrome people too. So that is why we need more research. We need more answers and we need more treatments because people are gonna need different treatments. Um, so as people grow up and become adults, their lives look a lot different. Just like when they were born, you know, they had more symptoms or they had less symptoms and maybe it doesn't correlate all the way through but everybody's unique. But like Clara said, we do know people in the community who have gone on and, you know, maybe they didn't even know that they had Kabuki syndrome until they had kids and they pass it on to their kids. Because depending on the gene and your gender, it can be up to a 50% chance that you pass it on to your children. So that's something that we definitely would encourage you to talk to a genetic counselor about um, for you or for your child, depending on that situation. So I hope that sheds some light on that. You guys feel free to add any follow-up questions in the Q&A as well. If, if we don't get to something today, I am collecting them all as well, and we can email you, or you can always email us too, if you're more comfortable asking a question that way. Um, Tristan asked, could an mRNA vaccine be developed that would code for either of these histone marker proteins to increase expression? Mm -hmm. mRNA uh, vaccines, I think, primarily have been investigated for infectious diseases so far. So for, you know, COVID, it's a very good example of the, I guess, the famous sample example that has brought mRNA vaccines to the attention of everybody. Um, they are, I think, still in very early stages um, to be investigated on uh, for rare disease. Um, we're not currently aware of uh, mRNA, mRNA vaccine being investigated by any of our researchers. Um, but yeah, that is interesting. And I, I think definitely a space that, you know, as technology advanced, something that uh, we can definitely keep an eye on. Um, Andrea also asked regarding the Atkins diet, can a breastfed baby benefit if the mother does the diet? So I want to emphasize that the modified Atkins diet currently is still in clinical trials. So it is not currently proven to have any benefit. Um, it is hypothesized that it could have a benefit, but it has not been shown. And uh, we would not recommend trying any diet unless until it has been clinically proven in a clinical trial where safety and efficacy can be carefully monitored. Um, so I think for this is a, is a wait and see, uh, wait and see space. And we're very much on top of uh, Dr. Harris's research 
which is the investigator looking into the modified Ekans diet and conducting the trial into the modified Ekans diet, um, currently first in Kabuki syndrome type one. And, and let me just sort of add in um, regarding the, the ketogenic diet, um, you, you certainly would want to talk to your doctor about whether or not this is something, you know, we, we haven't finished the research um, and we'll, once that research is done, those results will be published, but it's quite possible that your particular doctor might have um, information on whether this is something you should be looking at for yourself or for your child or loved one. Um, so just check with your physician and see what he or she says about that. While we're on modified Atkins, I'm just gonna, I scrolled through the questions. Where is it being studied? Clara mentioned Dr. Harris. We're referring to Dr. Jacqueline Harris at the Kennedy Krieger Institute. She is currently enrolling, but soon closing a modified Atkins um, clinical trial for Kabuki syndrome. Um, you can find the link to that on our website. I'll also just put it in the chat for you really quickly. And to emphasize, it's you know still a, a very early phase trial as well. So normally, um, for a treatment to be approved, it needs to go through um, phase one, phase two, phase three trials, and of increasing sizes. So I think the um, Jackie's um, current trial is still a, is an early phase one trial. So sort of the very first step of um, proving its efficacy. And there is no uh, control group. So actually um, maybe we will be able to see a trend in um, the efficacy of the Atkins diet, but right now um, it's not, uh, I guess, set up to actually be submitted for FDA approval. And one last, one last thing I wanna say about this. If you look at the literature of research, when women go on a, an Atkins diet or a ketogenic diet, one thing they do notice is a de decrease in the volume of breast milk they produce. So, you know, keep in mind that, you know, that's an important component of your baby's health as you're going forward to make sure there's a sufficient amount of breast milk. So again, check with your lactic lactation specialist and your physician if you're thinking about that. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so what are the best conditions for a Kabuki syndrome holder to test the treatments? So every clinical trial will have um, what they call inclusion and exclusion criteria, and every, every trial will probably have a slightly different uh, set of inclusion and exclusion criteria. Um, so, for example, um, you know, for the uh, modified Atkins diet, the, the criteria is that, you know, they need to be, um, I think, have Kabuki syndrome type 1, age 18 and older. Um, they need to have a clinical diagnosis as well as a genetic confirmation of a pathogenic mutation in KMT2D. Um, sometimes the exclusion criteria can may include that if you have a another health problem that would make, say, the intervention or the drug harmful to you, then that could become an exclusion criteria. Um, you obviously, sometimes there are often in a clinical trial many tests that you will need to go um, to do. So you may need to also be able to travel um, to the clinic site um, to participate in the studies. So, you know, there is no, I guess, an, a, a set criteria and every trial will have a different participation criteria. Um, so, you know, most trials will start say in the ad like older adolescents or adults age, but um, really it depends on the trial and what really the regulatory bodies like the FDA have approved um, in terms of, yeah, the clinical trial. Mm -hmm. Okay, Lucy have asked, what are the ideas for the biomarkers and outcome measures? So um, we will explain more about the consortium that we are setting up for um, validating and developing biomarkers and outcome measures. 
but um, it, briefly, the plan is to um, validate or develop three different biomarkers for Kabuki syndrome. So the first you may have heard is a, a DNA methylation signature, which is um, the signature that you test for when you get the EpiSign test. And um, there is potential that the signature actually changes with treatment. So we're going to look to develop this as a potential biomarker to uh, for its use as a potential therapeutic um, biomarker to test efficacy in clinical trials. Um, the other two projects, one is looking at different metabolites. So these are uh, different proteins or enzymes that uh, are present when you digest food or um, other reactions. They are sort of the molecules that you are producing. And uh, potentially there is a, a signature or pattern in Kabuki syndrome that is unique. And we're also looking at that as a biomarker. And then the last one is a, what we call an event-related potential, which is measuring brain activity uh, brain electrical signals in your brain that uh, responds to a particular stimuli. So in this particular um, protocol or in this particular biomarker, we are looking at an auditory stimuli, so a sound stimuli. And the way that, again, your the Kabuki syndrome um, activity in the brain reacts to this um, sound stimuli appears to also be different from, say, a control sibling. And so we're also looking at describing and establishing this signature as potential biomarker for Kabuki syndrome. And we'll be sharing a lot more about this, hopefully, in uh, November. Okay. Um, Nicole asks, my daughter is 14 and lives a very normal life. I have never been told that her symptoms may increase as she grows. This is the first webinar I have ever listened to. Welcome, Nicole. Um, is the first thing I need to do get her genetic testing? Amanda, do you want to? Yeah, I can. Um, and I don't. I don't want to be an alarmist by any means at all. But you, you've never been told that her symptoms can increase. And I guess when my my daughter was diagnosed, and the understanding that I have is that symptoms can change. Things aren't necessarily going to get worse or necessarily better, but things can change and things that weren't there at birth can start later in life. So how can we prepare for that? You know, we look at um, the recommended evaluations is probably a really good place to start. Just check off that list of recommended evaluations that we can share in the chat right now. Um, because as I said, things can change as, as they grow and we want to be as prepared as possible and meet them head on. Uh, and then regarding genetic testing, Genetic testing can give you more clues about what's what the cause is potentially, like which type she has. And as you look at family planning or she looks at family planning, having that genetic confirmation can give you more answers. Earlier, Clara mentioned inclusion and exclusion criteria for research. All of the research opportunities require a genetic test. We need to have that genetic confirmation so we know which mutation that potential participant has so that we can understand how the potential drug or therapy is affecting different individuals. Um, so if you need resources about getting genetic testing or how to go about that, feel free to let us know um, or email us independently or privately. You can privately email us as well. Um, I'm scrolling through. I'm trying to get like a couple quick ones real quick. Clinical research projects, progress with repurposed drugs. Um, we can definitely give a bigger update about that this fall. But Clara, do you want to touch on that a little bit? And then these are great yeah. questions, guys. They're just in depth. So let's let's start with the with the progress that we're seeing in repurposed, maybe. And I'll start tackling yeah. these other. Yeah. So with um, the repurposed drugs, we're still um, in preclinical stage. So this is still testing in cells and in animal models like mouse. Um, so. I mean, we do, we know when our researchers have identified a number, several candidates um, that potentially have shown changes in uh, these Kabuki syndrome cell or mouse models. Um, but um, yeah, they're still 
quite in early stages before it can actually reach um, clinical trials. So we will be definitely keeping an eye and speaking to the researcher um, to really better understand how we can potentially accelerate that work. And um, yeah, so we will definitely be keeping track of these research. And not to mention, Dr. Bruce Bloom have had many years in drug repurposing. And so we are planning to also leverage our expertise in drug repurposing and rare disease drug development to really help our academic researchers accelerate um, these yeah, drugs that can really benefit patients um, to clinical trials and hopefully eventually to FDA approval. Mm-hmm. Bruce, do you have anything else to add? No, I, I, I know we're going to go into that in more detail in one of the future. So if, if we get started, it's like pulling a, a thread on a on a garment will never stop because there's so much to learn, but it is a really important part of the research that we're thinking about. And one of the discovery grants they're working with some, or a couple of the discovery grants are also working with repurposed drugs. Mm-hmm. Yes, definitely. it's exciting. We know it's it can be the fastest and most efficient and definitely keeping an eye on it. Um, I, can, I can quickly answer this one. How many researchers around the world are focusing on Kabuki syndrome. I don't know the exact percentage, but for example, in our network, we have 112 researchers and clinicians who are signed up with the foundation to receive updates. And for a rare disease, that that is phenomenal. Um, On our website, we do kind of have those key players, those experts that if you wanna see somebody in person, these are the ones that we recommend. Um, And it also, they're the researchers a lot of times as well. Um, there are other foundations, places, and teams doing similar work. Absolutely. We're so lucky to have 12 groups around the globe that are designed to help people with Kubi syndrome and their families. Um, KSF, we really want to be making sure that we're connecting you to all those good resources. Like you said in your question, we want to be that global hub so that if you want to connect with a researcher, um, or a family in your country of origin, we're providing you that link. So you can find those on our website, on the four families page. And it's been exciting to see our global community grow um, as more and more people are diagnosed. And do you want to touch on prevalence really quickly, Clara? I, it's, it's kind of like pulling a thread, but you know we're going to talk about it again in the future and we're going to have more information about prevalence. Um, right now, the data is, is from the 1980s. So when we say prevalence, um, what, what does that mean? That means how many people have it or does it mean how many people are born with it uh, or how many people are alive today with Kubi syndrome? Clara, do you want to give like maybe the 60 second version of that and then we'll wrap up? Uh, yeah, so prevalence is, yeah, the typically when people refer to prevalence is the number of uh, people with a, a particular characteristic. So in this case, it would be Kabuki syndrome in the general population that have that particular characteristic. So in our case, Kabuki syndrome. Um, so we are working with an epidemiologist to look at um potentially updating the prevalence for Kabuki syndrome. Um, We're reaching out to various databases around the US, um, hopefully also internationally, depending on data availability, to see whether um, there are new data available to help us um, calculate this new um, data, which will be a very important data point for us to really understand how many people in the world actually have Kabuki syndrome. Um, this potentially, you know, impact health economics decisions and really help us show how important Kabuki syndrome research will be to the wider community. Absolutely. Uh, I'm going to drop a couple of things in the chat here and, and we are going to wrap up. Um, I've captured all of the questions. If you asked the question anonymously, I'm not going to be able to email you that answer. So if you want that answer, we're happy to send it to you, but please reach out to us. Um, with a good email address and let us know. I just put our email addresses in the chat. I'm also going to add, or one of our friends behind the scenes, we have Janet Lee, our executive director is running behind the scenes. So thank you, Janet. And again, thank you, Clara and Bruce and Jessica Weatherstone for putting this presentation together. Um, We're gonna add the gene reviews evaluations to the chat as well so that you guys can reference that. Thank you guys for all sharing your personal experiences in the chat. That's really helpful for everybody as well. Um, 
So we'll add all those to the chat. And we are also gonna add that link to donate. I, I really hope that you can consider starting a recurring donation today. If you go on our website, you can set up a monthly donation, just a few clicks, and you'll know that you're funding this research that can change our kids' lives. And if $20 seems too much, that's okay. You know, even $10 a month, it truly adds up because we're all contributing to this together. Um, and I especially want to thank those of you who have donated funds or your time in the past. Thanks to you guys, we are able to start multiple projects within NEAP. And this is the first of many presentations and webinars to make sure that you guys stay updated as well. Uh, I am going to add one more link in the chat, and that is a really short survey because we want to make sure that these events are helpful for you. They are for you. They are designed around your needs and your questions. So please take the time to fill out that quick survey if you have a moment. And with that, if nobody has anything else to add, we're going to go ahead and end this webinar and I'll get the recording up on YouTube as quickly as possible so anybody can catch up the beginning or end reports they want to revisit. Bruce, Clara, anything to add? We just want to thank you all for joining and we very much appreciate um, your time and as well as yeah, your interest and support. Yeah, same for me. Absolutely. Thank you all. We'll see you next time. Thank you.